guys. Welcome back to the backstop. Welcome back once again to the backstop, guys. Benny Bam coming at you strong with Jim Capanis Jr. and Eric Lineberg, the doctor of baseball, and of course the catcher who was not a spy but is here now catching for us right here on the backstop. We wouldn't be much of a backstop without a catcher, Jim. All right, that's how this kind of thing works. You got to have that stuff going on. Eric's calling balls and strikes back there somewhere. And uh, of course, He's making all of our decisions when it comes to the bullpen and not Kevin Cash. Eric, not Kevin Cash, is making our bullpen decisions, all right? So that brings us immediately into what everyone had to talk about. We haven't had a chance to because our last show was right before the game. And that is, of course, Blake Snell dealing your best pitcher. The guy that got you to the dance pretty much by being a great pitcher all year is constantly a great pitcher, of course, for the Tampa Bay Rays who, who you know, I mean, they're a small market club. They were able to uh, eliminate some bigger teams than them. Uh, the Yankees gone, the, the Astros gone, and you see little Tampa Bay uh, from the AL East sneaking in there um, and, and going up against the mighty Dodgers. The Dodgers end up taking it down, and I don't want to take anything away from the Dodgers. They had some great performances. Kershaw finally gets the monk off his back. Two wins in the series, maybe potentially should have been MVP over Seager. But, hey, you know what? They had a lot of great team performances. You know what I love about it is that when you can't decide who the MVP should be, that means you have a really good team, and that means a lot of great things for your team. You know, whether it's Betts, whether it's, you know, Kershaw, whether it's uh, him, whether Kike had some big hits. We talked about that. Jock had some big hits. We talked about that. Uh, but not all these guys played every game. Um, but when you talk about Snell and how he was shutting down this Dodgers lineup and he comes out and you could just tell that their whole team is dejected after that. And, you know, people giving us all the analytical arguments, Eric, what say you on that decision at that time in that moment, you let him go the third time through the lineup analytically, even though it says that that could be bad news against a, a, a Dodgers lineup, or do you, do you let a guy who's dealing deal and, uh, and be the guy that got you there? I was frankly shocked, Benny, because Blake Snell, um, I don't know if anyone saw the graphic on the television broadcast, Blake Snell, pitch for pitch, was equaling one of the greatest World Series games ever pitched by Sandy Koufax in 1963. And he was on a par to do better than Koufax did that night. Okay, now, analytics are what the Rays are all about. It got them there. You know, it helped that they had a Rosa Reina come up and do his hitting. Uh, but analytics can only get you so far. And I've said this for years. Uh, people will quote Billy Bean constantly as if he wrote the Bible of analytics baseball. And let's face it, all teams have their analytics departments. And a lot of things they do work. It has changed the game in so many ways. In fact, one of my listener questions tonight is, we're going to delve deeply into that. But uh, when uh, Snell got pulled, he had just given up a hit to Austin Barnes. And I call it a harmless single. It was a base hit up the middle. It wasn't rocketed up there. You know, Barnes got a hit. Barnes does get clutch hits from time to time. At that point, I saw Cash going out to the mound. And I thought, oh, he's going out there just to talk about how to deal with Betts because Betts was up next. I read later that when they saw Cash go out there and give the thumb for Snell to come out, Betts and Dave Roberts looked at each other and smiled because Betts was, for all of his greatness this season, had the fourth worst batting average against left-handed pitchers all year. He hadn't touched Snell all. He'd been striking out. And they're pulling the guy. And as strong as the Rays' bullpen was, I think, Benny, you alluded to this in the last show. They were overworked. They, those guys were appearing all the time. And like Jim had said, they brought in their closer in the fifth inning and the sixth inning. They were, they were playing every game like game seven. Game six – uh, pardon me. Yeah, game six. Yeah, he should have played like game seven. But at that point, with Snell throwing the way he was – he was hitting his targets. He was getting his pitches over. Was it a mistake that Barnes hit? Maybe not. Barnes is a major league hitter. Maybe he hit one of Snell's best pitches. But you don't just stop right there and go, oh, wait a minute, we got a one to nothing lead. That's another thing, a one-run lead. And you pull a guy doing a performance like that. What it took me back to was something we've discussed before. Game seven of the 2019 World Series, which was one of the great great 
series in, in recent history. Zach Greinke pitching. He was, I believe, he had one out in the seventh inning. He was still only at 82 pitches, if I believe. Uh, Greinke goes out there, he gets the first out, and he walked a batter. The Astros are also a very analytically driven team. They pulled Greinke, and we all know the results. Uh, the bullpen let him down. Howie Kendrick hit that big home run. The Nationals won. Thank you. I am not an Astros fan. I was very happy for the Nationals and for guys like Howie Kendrick because the Astros were an analytically built team. Their whole offense and defense was based on analytics and where to place people. The Nationals were a team of scrubs, basically. Similar, to Jim, like you've talked about the 88 Dodgers. A lot of guys that never even would have been there, cast off from other organizations. They pulled it together. Strasburg and Scherzer that were unbelievable in that series. But that play, pulling Zach Greinke in the uh, top of the eighth inning in that game, cost them the World Series. Kevin Cash made the same mistake this year. So for two years in a row, we've seen an analytic-driven decision lose a World Series. That's, uh, to me, if other managers and GMs don't see that, and don't start rethinking and going, wait a minute, you know, maybe, maybe uh, things are a little different in the postseason. And I'll quickly, before I take up all the time of the show, the Dodgers. Uh, in the previous show, we talked about, Jim, you mentioned that uh, I complained Julio Urias got pulled too early. And you said you thought they were maybe saving him for a relief role if needed. And look what he did. Two and a third. Got the save was on the mound, struck the final batter out, and was on the mound as a World Series winner. That was not an analytics move. Analytics would have said, no, nah, save Urias or pitch him with two batters. So you see the difference in Andrew Friedman and Dave Roberts this year as opposed to previous World Series where they would have gone down the line with the same guys. I probably would have seen Trinan come in in the eighth and – I hate to say it, but they would have gone to Jansen in the ninth again, probably. They didn't do it this year. They left Urias in there. He mowed the Rays down, and that was that, and they won. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to argue analytics is the way to go in baseball, you're not going to win the World Series. I'll say it right now. I'll say it every day. What do you think? Well, and I, I think there's a lot of uh, credibility, or, or you know, with with analytics. There's you know, the thing about analytics is they, it's proven that it works. Okay, the problem right. is the problem with analytics is it takes into account data that's outdated, it, that isn't for right now. And this same thing happens with anything, any business. By the way, if uh, you're watching this on. YouTube, yes, I'm rocking the goggles. Uh, I had an eye surgery, and you don't want to see the mess that is my right eye, so I'm going to just wear these to keep you, your, your dinner uh, down, okay? But um, the, uh, at the end of the day, man, that, 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 those analytic calls work over 162-game season because the averages are going to play themselves out. And I, and I can't, you know, I think the, the best use of analytics are act actually preemptive analytics where, for example – you know, had the, what if they'd seen that Snell's curveball, uh, the angle of it and the, and the spin rate of it was lessening, even though he was getting guys out. What if they saw that? We don't know. OK, what if they saw that his spin rate on his fastball was really declining? That's another instance where guys get crushed when, they, when their, you know, their stuff goes away, basically because they can't spin it like they were earlier and the angles at which they get. So you, know, you have to take this into account. What I think that we're missing is the human uh, seeing the analytics and then using them for their benefit for the moment, right? There's no game seven in 162 games or even a 60 game season. There's no game seven of a world series. And, and it's like, you have to sort of take the analytics with a grain of salt and think about, you know, this, this Snell, this, Mookie hasn't touched Snell. As even it, 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 They've been uncomfortable, ugly at bats. You know, do I let him go one more? Uh, even though analytics over the course of this guy's last four year career says don't do it. Right. right. And that's, I think that, that's the, that's the real debate is do you, if, but now if you're cash and you go against the numbers for a team that's so deeply embedded in them and you, and you lose, now you get fired. 
you keep your job if you stick with the with, with the plan. And the plan before the game was just that you don't see the lineup three times. So again, you, you have to think about now. Kevin Cash was named in the in the we're going to talk about in a little bit the manager of the year. You know, clearly he he's a good manager. Clearly, and right. and and clearly he did a lot with a little. You know, talk about a ragtag group of of second stringers on other major league teams coming in and being the the exactly. American League champion. So right. look, look, I, I'm not I'm not huge on analytics in terms of when 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 in, in a game seven scenario or a game six scenario or even a, a, a the, the win a playoff game. Um, what I do believe though, like Urias, um, I think that they took into account that this guy was just dealing so much. They took him out of that start knowing that they had all these other arms. And I think that's exactly what happened. When's the last time you saw a Dodger throw a three inning save or nearly a three inning save? I mean, never, never happens. Never, right. Never happens. So, so I'm, I'm saying this guy might be breaking the mold Urias for a new sort of type of pitcher who can start games and close games in, in a, and do less of less amount, you know, less throwing on each, you know, time, but be more beneficial for the team as opportunities present themselves, especially in the postseason. So, you know, you got to think about Urias's contribution, you know, as, you know, uh, another MVP level type of a performance. He was definitely MVP level performance. Uh, I can make a case that without him, had they not pitched him in game six, or had he come in and not done well, the Dodgers might have lost the World Series if it went seven games. Uh, let me go back to Snell for a second, though. You were saying, Jim, but possibly the analytics were showing that uh, the spin rate was down on his fastball or his slider. I was watching the broadcast, and they were analyzing every pitch. John Smoltz, of course, a great Hall of Famer, was doing the analysis. He hadn't lost any spin rate. His fastball was hitting its spots. His slider was hitting his spots. He was doing everything he set out to do. And as I said, he was pitch for pitch matching the greatest pitching, one of the greatest pitching performances in World Series history by Sandy Koufax in 1963. And they pulled him after that single. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Had had they been watching and seeing a spin race down a little, he's a little off on his location. Okay. But, um, that, to me, was one of the biggest mistakes ever made in a series. And I have great respect for Kevin Cash. I, you know, I believe he's a great manager, but uh, that was the wrong move, just like it was the wrong move to pull Zach Greinke the year before. Right. Yeah. And, by that, and by that token, it was still the wrong move to pull um, Urias. When, when Urias uh, got pulled in, in, when he, in the four and two-thirds that he had as a start, when he was starting, you know. Right. So that was the wrong but, move, but because it came back to pointed out the, re, the reliever that came in gave up a run. They lost that game by a run, and you could point to that and say, "Well, you know, without that run, maybe we go extra innings." So I, I agree with right. you totally. Uh, but at the time, you said, "I think maybe they're saving him just in case they needed a relief," and that's exactly what Roberts was doing, and it worked to perfection. Again, right. he's a unique yeah, pitcher who could do that. So go ahead, Benny. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, if if we're going to not value starting pitchers, then why are we paying them all this money to start? I mean, I, that's why I don't understand any of that. You know, uh, Jim, you you caught Randy Johnson. Can you imagine if Randy Johnson or Kurt Schilling had been pulled in 2001 after they allow a base runner in the seventh inning? I mean, they would have lost. They would have had no chance against the Yankees in that series. Um, there, you know, the guys that get you there and the guys that are winning these games in the regular season that allow you to get into the postseason by shutting these other teams down, um, you know, wh why would you not want to ride that arm? Like, if, if you're telling me at the end of a game, I've got my ace pitching well, a little tired, but pitching well, and still getting guys out as opposed to anybody in my bullpen. I don't care who it is in my bullpen, unless you got Mariano Rivera in there. That's the only exception, maybe. And even then, I don't know. You know, if I had Roger Clemens dealing on the mound, I don't even know if I'd go to Mariano. And the Yankees had that dilemma a few times, right? So I don't understand what these teams are doing. Like, you know, what more do you want than your best pitcher in the biggest game dealing on the mound? 
Like, what? <laughs> and you pull him because, well, maybe he won't be dealing that much longer. Okay, <laughs> that's a big maybe. That's a big maybe. I mean, you could point to any analytic in the world at some point, you know, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think if you had done that to uh, Randy, you probably would have taken one in the chest coming out of the coming out of the dugout to pull him or something. I mean, I don't think that would have <laughs> happened. Right. You know, that's just crazy to me that you would it's do just that. Different. And I've heard so many explanations. People that I really respect their baseball acumen, I've I've heard them talk about this and go, Well, no, you have to understand Snell hadn't gone past six innings the last three years, you know, and all this. Oh yeah, okay. But he was dealing right then. Can we agree that he was dealing at that moment? In that game, and the Dodgers couldn't figure it out. The Dodgers looked lost up there up against him. Even the guys that got on base were like, wow, I got on base? Like, I got on base. Like, I got on base. I got on base. Right. You know, it was like, <laughs> what, what is going on here? You know, your, your best pitcher dealing in the biggest situation. You know, like, I all day long. You know, I would, I would love to have something like that. But I don't know what it's like to have your best pitcher. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> well that that is clearly uh you know something like that that's a, a, a generation difference right uh, the generation before it's all in especially in your in the in the, that late of the world series you know a game game of of game six or game seven uh, how in the world you know do you let a guy you know how do you take a guy out like that right i mean you could never imagine those scenarios that you presented right but now like that's what you do like that's like this isn't just the Rays. This is like the Dodgers do it. The and, and name the team. The Astros do. Everybody does it. Like they they pull the, the starter um, early, and and there's no rhyme or reason other than they know something about this pitcher that apparently uh, the rest of us don't. You know, and that's that's something that I think is a little bit unique um, in regard to how uh, uh, you know the, the the way that they're using pitching staffs today versus how they've used them in the past. And again, you could go back into the seventies era or the sixties era and the relief pitchers were all the, all the, the guys who were former starters who got hurt. You know, there was, right. you weren't, no one, no one was a relief pitcher unless you had to be like you were forced to be, you know? Right. So, I mean, th pitching has just evolved so much more. And we'll talk about that more when we start talking about this, this, you know, the, uh, the Cy Young award. Um, and I wonder how, Ty Cobb did against Cy Young. Do we have Do we have the record of that? Just checking. No, <laughs> no we don't have that. <laughs> okay, but anyway, because uh, again, uh, the, the the pitchers are real nasty uh, now, and so, but but they're being they're being almost like, what's the word? Uh, you know, it, it, it's like it's like they're a wind up toy, and as soon as you know the, the last tick, like they pull you out, like instead of winding them up again, like they used to do to Randy Johnson and those guys. They go put him on the shelf. All right, you're you're done. Now we'll pull you back off there when it's time to wind you back up. And it's yeah, really you know, like I, clockwork. I, I saw a highlight clip today. <clears throat> excuse me, from the, uh, I believe it was the '81 World Series, which the Dodgers won under GM Al Campanis. But uh, what they were doing was showing Urias and Victor Gonzalez in this World Series versus Fernando Valenzuela in '81. In that game three that he won against the Yankees, he threw 144 pitches, and there was no one warming up at the pen, in the pen to come in. That's, just, that's how it was. It was the World Series. Season's over in a few days. If you've got to throw a guy 150 pitches and he's getting people out, you do it. Now that would never yeah. happen. I, I can't even imagine a guy right. going 100 pitches in the no, World no. Series. No, no, we have to we have to take you out, Kurt Schilling. There's blood on your socks, so you can't pitch anymore. Oh. You imagine? That's just that crazy. Magic, hey, that magic marker was really, really convincing, wasn't it? Yeah. Blood on his sock. Come on. <laughs> I obviously am not right? a Kurt Schilling fan and never have been. I respect his ability, but that whole thing was, uh, you know – a ploy to maybe get his team fired up something. He did it for a reason and it worked. Kudos to Kurt Schilling. Yeah. And I th I'm pretty sure he got a magic marker endorsement out of that. So it really worked out for everybody. <laughs> Probably. And, and, they, and then he spent it all in a video game that never actually came about. Google that. Yeah. Interesting story. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. We'll, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk awards. We have the finalists now for the awards. So first one we're going to go with, and uh, since we were just talking about it a second ago, 
Uh, we get the uh, NL finalist for MVP, Freddie Freeman from Atlanta, who, by the way, came back from COVID in order to have an MVP caliber season, by the way. Unreal. And, uh, and he had he had bad COVID symptoms, not just asymptomatic. He was, like, put out for a few weeks. Uh, Manny Machado from San Diego and, of course, Mookie Betts uh, from the Dodgers. Um, Eric, who, who's winning NL MVP? Well, and yeah, I'm glad you asked. I had to stifle a, either a cough or something when you said Machado's name. Uh, in all seriousness, there were other players who I thought belonged, but they can only nominate three. That's how it works now. And for our listeners who don't know, the votes are tabulated on the final day of the regular season. So whatever happens in the postseason does not impact the MVP of the regular season, which is how I think it should be. So let me talk about these guys for a second. Uh, Freddie Freeman, as you said, had to come back from COVID and did have a, a great season. Braves went to the playoffs. That doesn't hurt when on the last day of the season and they're voting, the team the guy is on is in the playoffs. So you know he's going to be there. Freeman had a great year. Uh, can you tell me someone of those three, though, who – Stole more than 10 bases, hit more than 15 home runs, drove in close to 50 runs, batted 300, was a clubhouse leader, uh, will probably win a gold glove. I go with Mookie Betts, for the MVP. And one of the main reasons being not just his outstanding play, but Jim, you've talked about it. What he brought to the Dodgers as a clubhouse leader, as a man of character, as a guy who would work with younger players, help coach them, a guy who had, you know, would go up to Bob Guerin and Dave Roberts and say, I noticed something and, you know, point something out. If you watch games closely, like we do, uh, Betts is never standing around talking to someone in the stands or sitting on the bench scratching his ear. He is always on the steps of the dugout observing what's going on and quietly saying things and pointing things out to other players. So for his leadership role, in addition to his play on the field, I go with Betts for the NL MVP. What do you guys think? Uh, to me, there's no, there's no second. I mean, there's only second place. I mean, in third place. And he's the, the other thing you got to take into account. And this is the only way he can maybe lose to Freeman is if there are simply more voters on the East Coast because you know this year everybody stayed in their own time zone. Right. So, you know, Mookie, Mookie Best didn't go back east and the Eastern Riders couldn't see him versus, you know, you know what I mean? And so yeah. you have to take into account that just a little bit, but there's there should be enough West, you know, West Coast Riders or West, you know, Western United States Riders to, to put him in. Then the other Riders can see what a great year he had statistically, even though they didn't see him in person like they would in the normal year. So I right. still think that, you know, and then he has a, a heritage of, you know, being in the, with Boston, being an East Coast player where they got to see him play you know mvp caliber baseball before so i think he's the the front runner most definitely and um and the and, and you like you said there's probably five or six other guys that should have been on that list but they had to pick two other guys and uh freeman freeman yeah machado ma, but you know i think tatis probably should have been in there instead of him quite honestly i was just gonna say if you're gonna pick a padre how do you not pick tatis right and pick machado? that one is, is crazy to me yeah absolutely Benny, what yeah. Do you think? Um, I mean, Freeman did bat 341. So, I mean, you know, especially coming off what he came off of. But, yeah, I mean, Mookie Betts, and it's got to be reassuring to be Mookie Betts and be looking at the finalist card and not to see Mr. Trout's name against you anymore, um, <laughs> as he did in the AL for all those years that he kept coming as a, a runner-up. He did win one, but still, uh, 2016, he had a great season, runner-up, um, you know. So, it must be nice for him now uh, to really um, – you know, I, I do think he'll get it. Um, you know, uh, Mookie added a, a different dimension that the Dodgers needed. You know, the Dodgers had all these pieces and they just didn't have like the the main piece, the, the gravity that kind of held it all together. Right. And, it, you know, even though they kept getting so close, they just, there was just this thing and you couldn't really determine what it was. And I'll tell you what, if you had asked me last year, oh, what, what would they need? Uh, oh, how about another all-star outfielder? That's not what I would have said. I would have probably wouldn't have said that. Right. 
because they had that, uh, you know, you just didn't seem like that was going to be what they needed. And, but when you have a chance to get a guy like Mookie Betts, you know, and credit to the Dodgers for making that painful sacrifice to go and get him, absorbing money for David Price, you know, giving up a guy like Verdugo who, you know, whatever you think about him, he had produced on the field for them, you know? Um, so it's not right. like he was a scrub or something like that. And he played uh, decently in Boston after that trade too. I mean, nobody's going to outdo a guy like Mookie Betts, uh, you know, Betts and Trout and all these guys, these guys are the top echelon, you know, they are the top of that. And the Dodgers made an all-in move and uh, it ended up paying off for them. They had a couple close calls in the playoffs for sure, but uh, this is a regular season award. And because of that, I do think you, you take into account all, all those different factors and uh, Mookie Betts, I think should, should win it. I agree. So I think we all agree on that. Uh, before we go to the AL MVPs, I want to mention going all in on trades. I know that right now it isn't, uh, excuse me, it isn't allowed yet to talk about free agent signings and trades and stuff. I don't think it's allowed until next week. Anyway, I heard from three different reliable sources who have given me good, good uh, information over the years about a potential trade that I'm going to talk about later in the show. And it does involve the Dodgers and it does involve a superstar. So uh, don't let me forget to talk about that. Now the American league, it's not as clear cut. I don't think as far as who the AL MVP should be. So you got well, Jose, how do you, uh, how do you pronounce his last name, Benny? Abreu. Abreu. It's Jose okay. Abreu, but you know, I was just thinking before you said that, Eric, uh, that exactly what the Dodgers need is another superstar player. Anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you hear the scenario, I think you're going to see why they want to do this trade. Uh, anyway, Jose Abreu. Uh, a lot of people thought he was going to leave the White Sox. He stayed. He had another great year. He has quietly put together some great seasons, and I don't know why he doesn't get uh, he plays in Chicago, a big media market. Why doesn't he get the respect that uh, guys like Frank Thomas got when they were there? I don't know. He had a great year. The other two nominees are DJ LeMahieu from the Yankees and Jose Ramirez from the Indians. Okay, now of the three, I'm going to give my pick to DJ LeMahieu. And uh, my reason being – I looked at his numbers, and over the course of the year, he never really had a spot where he slumped for more than a game or two. Had a lot of clutch hits. He's a former batting champion. It's also his free agent year, by the way. He's a free agent now. So he had extra incentive to put it all together. Uh, he was not a reason that the Yankees stumbled at the end and didn't make it. Uh, Ramirez had a great year. Cleveland had a great year. I just think that of the three, LeMahieu had the most impact on his team. Very close with the Brayu, though, but I, I go with LeMahieu. What about you guys? Well, and my, my opinion is, is with you, uh, same, same thing with you, Eric. It's, you know, uh, LeMahieu had a great season, um, regardless if it was coming up on free agent. But don't we see that a lot? You know, like a lot of guys step it up because they know the money, the money's around the corner. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then the other thing is his versatility on defense. You know, he can play, you know, just about any position on the infield other than shortstop. And, and of course, he can DH. And, you know, when you talk about a great swing, I mean, you got to put his swing in, in some of the top swings in, in baseball. I mean, just a tough out, uh, lets the ball, you know, travel and also knows how to extend and get out and hit home runs, get hit for power. Right. So I'm uh, a big fan of his, you know, and, and he's quietly, you know – you know, getting a, creating a great career for himself. Unfortunately, this might be the worst year in, you know, uh, in baseball history, you know, uh, to be a free agent. You know, they, they just announced they lost $8 billion or whatever the number was, a crazy number this past year. Um, and that's going to definitely contribute to, you know, some of the free agents probably having to take shorter deals or, you know, maybe in some cases they want to make a stand to sit out. So it'll be interesting to see, if he wins that award, though, I think there'll be a line for, uh, for with teams to, to try to sign him, you know. Right, right, right. What I, do you uh, think? I disagree with you guys on this one. I, I would go Abreu. Um, Abreu 
led the American League in hits, uh, slugging percentage. He also led the majors in RBIs and total bases. Um, and he had 19 home runs, which was second only to Luke uh, Voigt with the Yankees. And, um, you know, for whatever it's worth, I think he was more valuable to the White Sox and their success than LeMahieu necessarily was to the Yankees. I mean, he was valuable for the Yankees, but, you know, I, I don't know. I think if you take each guy off, the Yankees have a better shot of doing what they did right. um, by filling in and they've got depth there as opposed to, you know, put playing Encarnacion over every day or whatever the, the alternative would have been for Chicago. And um, yeah, so I think, I think Abreu uh, gets the MVP. I like Mayhew. I think he's a great player. Um, he's a free agent. Who knows where he's going to end up? Maybe he'll go back um, to the Yankees again um, because he's so good. Um, but, and I have a feeling he will, or they probably would have traded him. Uh, and Jose Ramirez, I'll just say, uh, guy, guy has finished twice already, third uh, in the MVP race, and it looks like it's going to happen for a third time. So three times yeah. not wow. gone for Jose Ramirez. Yeah, and it's, you know, he, uh, yeah, he's a solid, consistent player, but we've talked about this many times. Small market, small market. And so he's going to not get some votes because of that. I really think, but that, that, I don't disagree with you. I, if Abreu wins, I'm good with that. Well, how, how does this sound? Does this sound familiar to you at all, Eric? When I say names like Kenta Maeda and Injin Ryu, does that sound like something that you would, you would have any familiarity with? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up, Benny, because as you guys know, I, I'm a Dodger fan. All the people that listen to our show and watch us on YouTube know that. And in the off season, what did the twins go out and do? Uh, but pick up two former Dodger pitchers, Rich Hill and Kenta Maeda. All right. And Ryu went to the Toronto Blue Jays. All right. So let's look at the finalists for the Cy Young Awards. And let's start with the American League, since you're there. Shane Bieber from Cleveland. I'll talk about him more in a second. And who are the other two finalists? Kenta Maeda and Hinju Ryu. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine the Dodgers, had they kept those two guys, what kind of staff they would have had? But let me go to uh, Bieber for a second. Okay, here's a guy who was not expected to be the ace in Cleveland, as we know. That was supposed to be Clevenger. Uh, the unfortunate incident we talked about at length where he broke COVID protocol and got traded. He's gone. So Bieber kind of held down the fort. Bieber stayed very steady throughout that. He had a tremendous season. Can't take anything away from the season he had. Uh, they don't have Bieber. They don't go to the playoffs. Ryu, with the Blue Jays, you can make the same argument. Uh, if he's not on, on that staff, they don't make the postseason. Also, they had the extra challenge of having to play in Buffalo in that stadium. And, Jim, I know you've described that as being a very nice place to play, and they did a lot of improvements. But still, you know, it was a lot of unsettled things going on. And a lot of that went on in all of Major League Baseball this year. And before I go further with the MVP discussion, I want to address a question that I've had from a bunch of listeners, and I want to just give you my opinion right now. The question is, does the 60-game season even matter? Does the World Series ring even matter, or should there be an asterisk and all this? I'm telling you that in a lot of ways, this was a harder season for these guys than a full 162-game season. You know, all of us have suffered because of COVID and because of things going on. These players were quarantined away from their families, and – by quarantine, I mean, you go to the ballpark, you go back to the hotel. Uh, it was a very difficult season for a lot of those reasons. One team, you might remember the Miami Marlins, most of their veteran players tested positive and the first two weeks of the season, they couldn't even play. So they had to come back and play, no days off, double headers, time after time, and they made the playoffs. But, uh, so uh, to answer all of those of you who've written me, and I read a bunch of emails and messages on Twitter. I even got Facebook mess messages from people 
saying, oh, it's a 60 game season, it doesn't matter. Yes, it did. This, I don't care who won the World Series. I mean, the Mets could have won the World Series, and I would have said kudos to you guys because it was a difficult, difficult challenge. I think Major League Baseball did a great job with the protocols they installed, and this was a legitimate season. Okay, I won't rant on that anymore. Let's get back to the Cy Young. Again, Bieber, fantastic year. Uh, a lot of people will argue that there hasn't been a year from a Cleveland pitcher like that since uh, probably the 60s. Uh, Ryu had a great year. I am going to go with Kenta Maeda. I believe he should be the Cy Young Award winner in the American League. He pitched. Uh, every time he pitched, he kept them in the game. They were always getting six innings out of him, seven innings. And here's a stat that wasn't promoted very widely. In games when Maeda started, if the Twins had a two-run or more lead going into the seventh inning, they didn't lose all season when he pitched. Uh, you might remember, we, I think we were on the air the night he took a no-hitter into the ninth inning. And uh, they let him go over his pitch count. He gave up a hit. And sadly, his bullpen lost the game. But – uh, Maeda gets my vote, uh, just and not for sympathy. I don't. Uh, he was a Dodger. I liked him as Dodger. I don't know what his role would have been because they've been using him in the bullpen and closing and this and that. Uh, so I thought it was a good career move and probably a good overall life move for him when he got traded to the Twins, and he went out and proved what he could do. I think he deserves it. What do you guys think? Uh, and I, I, I've agreed with you on all the other ones, and I'm going to agree with you on this one too. Uh, and then the other thing you have to think about, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the change to, you know, the other venue to, you know, moving from one league to another league as a pitcher, um, I think is helpful. I think, it, you know, a lot of times the, the batters hadn't seen you so much and probably not a lot of pitcher or batters had seen the, in the central divisions, you know, that's all they were playing, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of Dodgers, you know, anyway. Um, and I think that actually helped play in both of Ryu and his performances this year. But yes. I saw some numbers by Bieber that were just like out of this world, um, incredible, you know, uh, stats earlier in the season that, that I wonder, you know, uh, looking at it from a, a writer's perspective, they, they might see those numbers, I think, uh, and, and, and they might be enlightened by those numbers more so than they were by, you know, Maeda's, you know, 82 mile an hour fastball. And, you know, I mean, he really lulls you to sleep up there. You know, it's a totally different you know, way of pitching. And that's what makes him so tough to hit. But, you know, my, my, my head says uh, Maeda, um, but I think part of, uh, but there could be, a, a, you know, a, a, like a, like a, um, you know, kind of a surprise on this one with Bieber. I think, right. um, I think you guys both made, you guys are both trying to make the case for Maeda. And I think you actually ended up making the case against Maeda in different ways. So um, when you said Maeda went to a, a different league and that that ultimately can benefit him, I would agree. And Bieber didn't do that. Bieber was in the same league and finished fourth in uh, the Cy Young running last year and then got even better this year. He had two more wins than Maeda. He had a 1.63 ERA. Uh, Maeda had a 2.70. And Eric, when you were talking about how Maeda, they won the games that he started, well, he didn't pitch complete games. That just meant that they had a good bullpen at the end of those games, right? Like, he didn't pitch the whole game. I mean, they, 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 they closed a lot of those games, right? So that's, Well, that's, that's a good, good point, Someone had to get him there. Well, that's true, but I'm saying, like, you know, there's a lot of other guys that are good pitchers where that didn't probably happen, and they didn't end up getting the win because their team lost the game or uh, ended up winning the game, even though it came back and got tied or whatever the case may be. That's so a good Bieber, point. That's a good point. Bieber what, led the AL in wins with a ERA 1.63 and strikeouts with 122. That's the trifecta right there. And none of those other, those other two guys and all the other guys that were considered before the finalists, none of them had – those kind of dominating numbers. I mean, Maeda was six and one with a 2.7 ERA, but I'll take 1.63. That's over a run less, right? Two more wins uh, on a team that was competing against Minnesota in the same division, right? And then Who you won got the division, you. by the way? Who won that division? <laughs> it came down to like the last day or something, right? Like, I mean, okay. Sorry, and then, 
I had no, to get you fine. that one for the But Braves if anything, I think you can make a stronger argument for Ryu because of the division that he had to pitch in uh, going up against the Yankees all the time and stuff, especially this year when it was all one side of the coast is all you were doing. So, I mean, Ryu uh, had some had some real good stuff. 2.32 ERA. He had a better ERA than Maeda, um, 5-2. and two. Um, So, I mean, I think that, you know, when you look at those things, I think those two guys kind of like are, are real close, you know, Maeda and Ryu. But I think because Bieber had that trifecta and finished fourth last year, even though that doesn't ultimately come into play for this, but it does show you his consistency and getting better in the same league against uh, a way better division this year in the central than I think a lot of people expected after it wasn't so good the years before. So I, I would go Bieber on this one. Okay. Okay. Good point. Uh, good points on Ryu. I hadn't thought about some of those things, but uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it turns out. Uh, at this point, let's go from the uh, MVPs and Cy Youngs we've talked about. Uh, actually, we got to talk about the National League Cy Young first. And the three nominees are Jacob deGrom of the Mets, who has won the previous two years, you Darvish of the Cubs, and did I say three years or two years? He's won the previous two, deGrom. Okay, you Darvish of the Cubs, and a guy that we all love, Trevor Bauer of the Reds. Okay, now... Right off the bat, DeGrom had a great season to a point, and he had a bad out, outing against the Phillies in, I think it was mid-September, and at that point, something happened. I don't think he got injured, but they started pulling him out earlier. They were out of the race, pretty much. The Mets were chaos this year. Let's just be frank about that, and DeGrom may suffer because of the way the Mets were run and the way things happen, he may end up suffering by not winning this award if people think he deserves it. I happen to think Trevor Bauer should be the winner of the NL Cy Young Award. Uh, Bauer took a team, uh, Cincinnati Reds, good, talented team, but uh, you know he had to go out there and pitch sometimes in circumstances where he had no defense behind him. They didn't score a lot of runs. He still had an outstanding season. And like him or not, uh, Trevor Bauer is who he is. He's uh, outgoing. He's very outspoken on social media, as we have talked about. Uh, his personality may not, may not play in Cincinnati any better than it did in Cleveland. I would love to see him play for the Angels next year. Trevor's a free agent. Uh, but I also can't say enough about you, Darvish, and what he did for the Cubs this year. Uh, you basically resurrected what was once considered to be a great career. You guys remember his first couple of years when he was here. Uh, he came back after that uh, disastrous 2017 World Series, where, by the way, the Astros knew every pitch he was going to throw. That was why he got lit up. But he came back from that. He bounced back and had a tremendous season. And I wouldn't be sad to see Darvish get it. Uh, but I go with Trevor Bauer. What do you guys think? I'm going to go with the uh, Darvish on this one uh, for pretty much no other reason than his team w were, were winners. And they, you know, they got to, uh, I think they got to at least a wild card game. They um, did. That does play a factor. And then that, that to me is always seems to be a part of it, especially on the pitching side. Um, and, and, and as much as you know, we, I, we like Bauer, I just think, you know, they, 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 well, you know, and again, if you look at it from an individual standpoint, you know, you, you look at the stats and the stats alone show that, you know, he's, he's done better than Darvish. But again, I seem to be a little old school and I like to see how a pitcher makes an impact on a, on a season uh, right. versus an impact on his, you know, his, his stats. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just leaning toward Darvish just a hair, just for that reason alone. But I do want to make an, a, a point and we, I jokingly talk about Ty Cobb all the time. Okay. Uh, and how, how do you hit with a split handed grip? And, you know, how are you going to like, so, the so look at these. Up. Yeah, the great, yeah, the great up. tie cop, the great tie cop. And so let's think about his little split handed grip. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. They put him in the phone booth. Boom, he ends up today. And now he's got to face three Asian dudes who are up for the um, Cy Young Award that, 
again, you guys can roll your eyes, but I'm telling you that uh, that's the, uh, the biggest difference that the pitchers that those guys faced in those, in those eras are nothing like the guys that are pitching today or even in my, in my generation, Eric's a couple years older. Just a totally different level and degree of nastiness that just was not present in the old days. And so I'm going to get off my Bill and Ted's uh, annual or, or weekly, uh, <laughs> weekly soapbox. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. <clears throat> First of all, if you put Randy Johnson against Shoeless Joe Jackson, I'm not sure Shoeless Joe Jackson would have had the same success either. But I, I don't know. Maybe Benny, Benny, Benny. Benny. Maybe would have. This maybe is a would've. discussion we're going to have sometime on this show. You uh, maybe, maybe Shoeless maybe Joe versus Randy Johnson. Yeah, with Jim catching. Know. That's pretty nasty. <laughs> Especially uh, the long We got to give no. him some. We got to give we got to give him some, some New Balance spikes at least. She was Joe. He's going to try to play pitch against Randy, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, but not Ty Cobb. But not Ty Cobb. <laughs> Ty Cobb just gets this, and that's it. Nothing modern. No, no, than Ty Cobb. But okay. but if you look at Sheila's Joe's stance, he actually looks like a modern hitter. He looks like a his load is like what what lefties did, and he would have struck and, out, and you know it. He would have struck out, and you know it. Uh, against Darvish right. for sure with the split. Maybe. Yeah. Um, Again, the, the, the thing is, is seeing when I went over to play on the Olympic team in Japan and, and, and facing these guys in Korea and facing these guys in, you know, Taiwan, they're coming from angles that we, we never saw. And these guys were not throwing hard. My Ada throws, you know, like I was saying earlier, 86, maybe, maybe top side in the low, ni- the low 90s when he's trying to throw a four seamer. But it's all the different angles and speeds and accuracy and, 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 and they exploit your weaknesses and they, and they know they scout you. I mean, it's a totally different level uh, of, 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 of trying to hit off of these guys versus big, tall, lanky, you know, and in the old days, all white guys, right, throwing right over the top, throwing, talk about throwing to the third time around the order. These guys threw the sixth time around the order. I mean, seriously, like you can't even, I mean, that's another huge thing that, that you can't really now look, I'm sure there were guys like Bob Feller who, you know, could really bring in and could get guys out today. And I'm sure no problem. It's just the, uh, it's those guys who were just those, some of those hitters. Like, and again, I, I, Babe Ruth, I put in the same category and Brett Boone's all over Babe Ruth for the same reason. Like, like put that 40 ounce, try to hit the 40 ounce bat today. Like, forget it. I don't care who you are, you know? So uh, anyhow, uh, I think that we look at the, 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 uh, the variety of these of the backgrounds of these six pitchers and where they're from and, and how they got to where they got to, it's all different. And, 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 and this is the wonderful thing about major league baseball today, the different, you know, ethnicities that all come to America to be stars. And here they are, you know? Yeah. Right. I think, uh, well, go back to, to the, uh, the NL Cy Young, um, it's not Rick Roden, um, but no, it's the, uh, so Bauer, <laughs> Bauer or yes, or yes, three. Bauer struck out 100 batters over 73 innings, 1.73 ERA, which was the best in the NL, and he allowed one earned run or fewer in eight of his 11 starts, while striking out at least 12 batters in four of them. Okay, so pretty, that's pretty dominant. Um, Darvish though had a stretch where he went seven and zero with a .98 ERA from July 31st to September 4th. And he still finished overall eight and three with a 2.01 ERA and 93 strikeouts and 12 starts. This is, uh, to me, um, and and DeCrom, I mean, being in consideration for your third straight Cy Young Award on a team that doesn't win is impressive. That's Mike Trout territory as far as an award goes like that. Um, But, and I definitely think DeGrom, if it wasn't for, he had a really bad start that really inflated his ERA against the Phillies, I think. Um, but other than that, if he hadn't had that, I think he'd be right in the conversation with these two other guys. But since that didn't happen, I think it cost him, especially in a short season where he might have been able to make that up over the over a longer one. Um, I Man, it's so close between Bauer and Darvish. But I'm going to have to give it to the, the future angel, Trevor Bauer. You know, I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, I think it's just, you know, I got everything I get. Trevor, you, you, you deserve the award so much. You deserve it so much. And you deserve a contract for that award. That rewards you for winning that Cy Young, Artie. Can you can you write the check, please? All right. <laughs> you know what? I agree with you about Trevor and and Artie and him deserving the award. And I I can't tell you how much I believe Bauer is a perfect fit 
for the Angels. Um, I don't know why he wouldn't go there. You know, it won't be a money issue. If they don't sign him, I'm going to seriously start thinking, you know, Artie, maybe uh, you need more advisors or something. And as you point out, Bay, they need a general manager really soon. Uh, I, I'll put the three of us up to be a team general manager until they find one. Well, they just lost their uh, special advisor to the White Sox. Tony La Russa is now the White Sox manager, his former job. The, the White Sox asked the Angels if they could interview him. Remember, we talked about that in the last show. So yes, when I that, do. <laughs> when, when, when that happens, that, that guy's already in consideration. Or, or You know what I mean? Like, they're already actively seeking on hiring him. And, and he was basically Artie's right-hand man um, and, and Epler's right-hand man. Um, and, and again, now he's gone. So there's, there's, and then they just let, but they just let go of two assistant GMs. So like, like if, if a team want, like Bowers agent, who, who would he call? Like with the secretary I mean, or maybe, she, maybe she got hacked. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it would be, it would be either John Carpino or Bill Stoneman, who's still an advisor, former GM. But yeah, I look, mean. Look, the Tony, La Russa, Tony La Russa decision by the White Sox to hire him to come back and manage after his long storied career that we talked about last week. He is uh, what 77, Jim, is that old? Your dad is? 76. 76. 76. My, dad, my dad was his roommate on the Pirates, okay? And, okay. And, they're, they're, and he was one year younger, so my dad's 77, he's 76. All right, so tell me, how is Tony La Russa going to relate to a 25-year-old outfielder or a 28-year-old pitcher who came up to the, the game the way it's played today and through analytics, how is he going to relate to those players and a manager who came up, you know, I don't know, I'm beyond words. When I heard about it, I think I originally got this news when Benny sent it to me through Messenger. And Benny might remember, I said, this is a joke, right? And no, it is not a joke. The White Sox brought him back. We talked on the previous show on Reinsdorf and why it probably all happened. So I don't want to rehash that. But you fire your manager who got you to the postseason for the first time in 12 years. And you hire a 77-year-old man who's, I, I'm not being mean or cruel here. His best days are over. They're behind him. It isn't going to happen again in Chicago with La Russa. Why do you do that? One of the, uh, I don't want to use a cruel word, but it was one of the most imbecilic decisions I have seen in a long time. Uh, I have to believe it was Tony La Russa's ego telling him, hey, I'm going to show everybody I can come back and win another World Series without the Bash brothers and without Albert Pujols and without this guy and that guy. What in the world caused that to happen? All I'm going to say, guys, is it's 2020. That's my only excuse. And, I heard uh, Reinsdorf, the owner, was realized that he made a serious mistake when he let when he fired him in the first place, some 20 some years ago. Because 30. then Larusa, 30 years ago, then Larusa went on and became the Hall of Fame manager that he is after he was fired from that job. So it's almost like this guy wanted to like go back to 31 years ago and, and not make that mistake again. Like he's trying to, to do the Bill and Ted time machine again, but uh, he's doing it for real this time. He's bringing the same dude back. Hey, look, Jerry, I, look, I, I have a lot of respect for the guy. I, 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 I hope he understands what he's up against, what he's dealing with. I'm sure he does being an advisor for all these years. What I don't understand though, is like how, how is, like you said, how is he going to relate to certain guys? You know, there's a really good young infrastructure on that team, and a lot of a lot of them are Latin guys. Right. You know, are, are you going to be able to deal with that? Now, I know he speaks Spanish. I know he's that that part of it will probably be easy for him, um, or easier. But again, it's it's like they're you know he's like the grandpa. You know, like you know what I mean. Right. So I, I I don't know. I just don't know how the players are going to relate to him. I don't know how you know they're going to talk about him behind his back or, or, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, you don't know, you know, how, what part of the chemistry is he going to be good or bad for the chemistry? Right. So, so, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see how that plays out. So there's, there's even more to, so like 
so Tony La Russa was 67 years old the last time, and he, he really had a storybook ending. They walked off a World Series they probably shouldn't have even won, I mean, in 2011. They had a better team the first time, and uh, yes. but they, in 2011, they were, you know, they, they, they won. They only won 90 games that year, which, you know, for a World Series winning team, that's not, like, a lot, a lot of games. I mean, that's like right. they won exactly 90. They were 90 and 72. They weren't that far above 500 in 18 games in a 162-game season, but – Hey, they pulled it off. He was able to, uh, you know, 66, 67, yeah, walk into the sunset, you know, and, uh, and, and that was really pools his last good year there as well. Sure. Even though he was, he was already kind of declining uh, before the angels even picked him up as far as his individual production, but the team was still successful. They still had Wayne Wright and Yachty and these guys, a lot of those guys were in their prime or entering their prime at the time. So that kind of helped lift, um, you know, uh, the, the decline from some of the other guys they had had from the first time around. But think about this. Not only <laughs> – okay, so he hasn't managed uh, Tony La Russa since 2011. And I, I don't doubt the guy can manage. I mean, he's proven that, right? He's, he's proven it. He hasn't managed a game in the American League since 1995. Think about that for a second. Wow. Since 95. So, oh, wow. he, so NL is different. So the NL is different. There was still a, a, a pitcher hitting when he was managing with the Cardinals from 96 to 2011, right? So it was a different strategy, and he played it well. I mean, he did what he had to do. Got a couple World Series out of it with the Cardinals. And he does have a ring with Oakland in the American League and obviously was also the manager of the White Sox before that when the White Sox had actually made stupid decisions back then and let people make decisions that shouldn't have been making decisions that got rid of Lewis in the first place, which is what allowed him to go to Oakland which is the decision that they're trying to undo now, only you can't undo it because you don't have a flux capacitor or Doc Brown or 1.21 gigawatts. You don't have any of that stuff. You can't go back in time. And Jerry Reinsdorf is delirious. He's like 86 years old. He's delirious. He's still making these decisions like he's spry. And quite frankly, he never made him good for any of the clubs he has. Um, so, I mean, you know, the best movie ever did was probably hiring Phil Jackson. And that was like, I don't even know if he meant to do that. That was probably a complete accident. So, I mean, you know, and Phil ends up being an all-time great coach, but he also coaches some of the greatest players of all time. But other than that, I mean, his questionable decisions, uh, you know, standing up to his star players and their faces and, you know, all this kind of stuff, getting rid of guys like LaRusso only goes further to prove that he's been this way the whole time. Getting rid of Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan proves that he's been this way the whole time. This is not just only now, but now it's getting even worse where you're trying to go back in history and relive something from literally 30 years ago. And the person that suffers here is Tony LaRusso because he's hopeful. He's He wants this to work out. He wants to be able to to, you know, guide these guys. And I don't doubt that that leadership is there, um, but the game has changed. I do think that if you see his best pitcher in the seventh inning dealing, that he's going to stay in the game. I'll tell you that much right now. And if a GM comes down to tell him any different, I'm sure that's not going to go over real well because he is an old school manager. He is a guy used to making those decisions. He, he'll he say, hey, I'll take that into account, but I'm not going to do that. And we've seen the way that's worked out with other guys over time. Uh, right. Even recently, Mike Sosha killed me, but that's ultimately what happened there. I mean, you know, and, and it just didn't, you know, some of these guys get, get stuck in that and the game has changed a little bit. And I guarantee you LaRusso right now was thinking, no, my starting pitcher is going to go seven, eight innings, you know, like it's, it's, he's got that same mentality because that's what it was like when he managed. And, um, you know, I, I wish him all the best. I, I honestly hope they win a World Series with him there because – he deserves that, and he, he can obviously manage. He's been a great all-time manager, but the dude's a Hall of Famer already. I don't know what he has to prove, um, and it just it kind of makes me sad because, you know, Tony Russo is just a great, great manager. I would love to see him stick around with the Angels one more year, him and Pujols go out together, you know, and just be done, and maybe Pujols comes back and manages or whatever. I mean, that's up to him, but, right. but that would have been a cool story, and uh, it kind of – it kind of rubs me the wrong way. And, and if you hear in all the reports about the way this played out, there's a lot of people inside the White Sox organization that are not happy about this. And that's never a good way to start. Right. You know, and, and since we're on the topic of managers and we're talking about awards, before we get to Rookie of the Year awards, let's talk about the nominees for Manager of the Year. And let's start with the American League. Okay. Kevin Cash, obviously should be one of these three picks as a finalist. He took the Rays 
Uh, we all know about the Rays, lowest payroll. They have a lower payroll than the Oakland A's, and they made it to the World Series. Uh, he put together pieces. Uh, Jim referenced last week that uh, the Rays go shopping in the Walmart clearance section and find gold, and Cash has to put those pieces together, figure out how to manage them, and win, and he did. So he deserves to be in there. Montoya from the Blue Jays, I have no qualm with that selection as a finalist. And I mentioned it earlier, isn't it interesting that the fired Chicago White Sox manager, the first manager to take them to the World Series in 12 years, fired, and he is one of the three finalists for the Manager of the Year Award. And I'm telling you right now, I want Rick Renteria to win that award for that reason. Although I really, I believe Kevin Cash of the three deserves the award. I hope Renteria wins it. I really do. I do. What do you guys think? Kevin Cash should lose that award for that stupid decision he made, even though that's not going to count for anything. But honestly, <laughs> like, that was so bad. Like, but, you know, One I love works. Montoyo. The thing about Montoyo, too, uh, Jim, I know that, you know, Jim, you can touch on, on Plain and, and Buffalo, but this team didn't even – his his own country wouldn't even take the team. They won't let him go through customs. Their own he country, was a teammate of mine. Uh, yeah, they wouldn't even let him go through customs. So, I, I don't – like, they didn't even have a home stadium, and they still bowled and just focused and got the job done. So, if anything, I think – but I agree, Rich Rio would be a <laughs> – that would be a good way to stick it to Ryan's door, wouldn't it? Right. And, and I, so, I think – Go ahead, Jim. Well, I was just going to say that Montoya was actually on my team in Puerto Rico. Um, great guy. And then Renteria was on my team with the Mariners at big league camp a couple of years. And then, and I got to know him really well. And I played against him in winter ball in Mexico. Um, and both of these guys are the solid humans. Like that's, I know them. I know them as people. Right. Right. And, uh, and, and you, and you know, you know, you could, when someone's a jerk, you know, I mean, you, you just know, and you stay away from those guys or, or, you know, you have to work with them, but you don't like them, you know. Right, uh, and in right. Bo- and in both of those two guys' cases, I liked them both, and I thought they were really great. Both of them were infielders. Um, so that also um, meant that I had to throw the ball to them, you know. So, I mean, we had to work together and, and you know. Um, so, uh, with that being said, um, you can't take away the, the fact that Kevin Cash was playing with a, a freaking junior college team. or so. it, it, That's practically what it seemed like. I mean, I'm serious. Like, we're talking about – a bunch of, um, you know, holdover position players who couldn't find a home anywhere else. Right. With, with a really good pitching staff that, that they did calculate it, put, put together. You know, they, they, they did this over the last couple of years, put a really good um, pitching staff together, which obviously was none of his uh, doing. However, he was able to play the, eight, play the cards pretty well, obviously, except for that, <laughs> that little thing with Snell we talked about earlier. Right. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, man, you know, uh, when you watch them play, okay, they didn't blow teams out and they didn't get blown out. And if I bet if you go look back through the season, you're going to see that their losses were most of their losses were probably one or two runs. They, they right. were in most of the games and that's exactly how they played during the playoffs. And when I saw that it was four to two or, or three to two, you know, against a team earlier in the, in the, in the playoffs, I said, these guys are still in it because that's how these guys roll. They love these tight games. These tight games are what they live for, right? right. And then you, see, then you see these great performances by the players, great performances by the pitchers. Again, analytics had to play a lot into all of that, right? We have to keep that in mind and, and realize that that was part of the reason for their success and also the reason that they lost the World Series. But I go with Kevin Cash on, on this, this one, um, even though – I think the other two guys are very well deserving. You just can't. I think you just can't uh, deny the the fact that he got these he got these guys to the World Series with with that with that team. You know. Right. I agree. And as our listener Jeff Hamilton last week pointed out, this was a rare year. The two best teams got to the World Series. That's the way it's supposed to be. When I was a kid, Jim, and when you were a kid. The winner of the National League played the winner of the American League, World Series. No playoffs. There were no divisions. There were no wild cards. So Kevin Cash pulled that off with not much money, not a lot of leeway on moves he could make. He put it together. He was able to recognize the best 
in his players and bring it out. He brought out the best in those players. So I'll, I'll go with Kevin Cash as the manager of the year. I just want Renteria to win it to stick it to Ronnie Source, really. Yeah, that'd uh, be awesome. Now, let's go to the National League. There are three nominees. Okay. And before I tell you their names, I will tell you that Dave Roberts is not one of them. How do you have a 43-17 and 17 record, the best in baseball, manage the way he did during the season and not at least, at least be one of the three nominees? That's a question that I, just baffles me completely. But anyway, let me go to the, the nominees themselves. Jace Tingler from the Padres. Uh, got a hand at the Padres. Great year. He was a rookie manager. But I put the Padres' success on what the general manager did at the trade deadline and all those moves he made. They had a great year. Uh, Tatis was just a monster for the first half of the season. But then he tumbled. He ended up hitting about 280, I think. Great year, no matter what. But he stumbled a little bit. The moves they made at the trade deadline – kept the Padres in the race and fighting the Dodgers. So Tingler did a good job managing young players. That's not easy to manage a team of young guys with only a couple veterans. Uh, David Ross of the Cubs. I was curious when they hired him how he was going to turn out as a manager. He said, just played, he just retired from the World Series winning team. I know he, he was popular with the players and with the press and everybody, but it doesn't always translate into good management. But I think in David Ross, you've got an example of a manager who directly gets the major decisions directly come from Theo Epstein, the general manager. I really believe that. Ross is a great guy. He made some great moves as a manager, but they didn't go far in the playoffs. The third nominee is Don Mattingly of the Marlins. And let me tell you what this guy had to do for people who don't know. All right, he had a, a scrappy team to begin with. He had a few veterans that were, were good. Then COVID hit. And the first at least two weeks of the season, maybe a few days longer, the Marlins couldn't play. And a whole bunch of their players didn't play this season. Uh, he had to go to minor leaguers, taxi squad players, people who had been unproven in the past, and put them on the field. And as I mentioned earlier, they had to play every day, no days off. Bunch of doubleheaders in September they had to play. And, okay, go ahead and tell me, oh, there were only seven inning games, those doubleheaders. Hey, you play back-to-back -back four days in a row, doubleheaders, and tell me if those two innings make a difference or not. Do I have to? <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. So, Mattingly, I think, you know, as a manager – He's done well in the past, but I think for this particular team with these young players who really had nothing to lose, a, a lot of these guys didn't really ever think they had a shot at making the major leagues maybe. And here they are on the biggest stage in the world. They reeled off a bunch of wins. They made it to the playoffs. Uh, to me, it was one of the greatest feel-good stories of the year, what Mattingly did. And yeah. I could name a hundred other reasons, but for those reasons I just mentioned, I picked Mattingly for the manager of the year of that group. What do you guys think? Uh, I'm right there with you on that one too. And um, I think that's one of the, the toughest, when you talk about the 60 game season being tougher than the, the long season where these guys get like four days off a month and, you know, a right. lot, lot less, you know, they get, they get travel days off. There was no travel on cause they're all in the same time zone. Really. They just kind of, Maybe had an earlier game, which is even – dude, let me tell you what. I'd rather, you know, uh, deal with taking a nap before I go to a game than having to wake up early and play a, an 11 o'clock – you know, uh, uh, be at the park at 11 when I'm used to waking up at 11. You know, and that's right. a major league schedule. A, a baseball player's schedule, you know, you go to bed at 2 or 3 in the morning and you wake up at 9 or 10 the next day. You know, I mean, it's, right. it's kind of that way. And you, you sneak in a nap at your locker, you sneak in a nap on a bus, you sneak in a nap on a plane and you get your, you know, you get your winks in, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, uh, regimented like a lot of people are so used to. It's very, it's very challenging. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so to play a double, all those double headers, 
Um, yeah, I, I can't, you know, the Padres, I think, you know, the guy did a good job. Um, he's got a, a, you know, bunch of super, you know, current and, and future superstars on that, on that team, you know, and they're going to give the Dodgers some fits in the next couple of years for sure. Um, and then I'm sorry, who was the, uh, the, the other, uh, it was David Ross. Sandy. Oh, Ross. Okay. So Ross wins for best TV commercial. Have you seen those kettle one TV, the vodka commercials he's doing? Oh I'm my God. The, the, Google it. You got to watch them. They're awesome. He plays every <laughs> character. He plays every character. And so they got him dressing up as all these different people. And he's, and he's, he's, he's a great, he's great at it. Okay. And he, and he's the bartender too. So, um, he definitely wins for best commercial of all those guys, most definitely. And I think, you know, there's some, some, I think some credence to what you said about Theo Epstein really making the big calls before the game even starts and his analytics team making the big calls before the game even starts. Yeah. That makes it a lot easier because now you already know, well, this is how I'm rolling. If this scenario presents itself, like there's already a cheat sheet, you know, yeah. Um, but I think I think today though the manager's real job is is to get the players fired up, and that's what I saw the Cubs were like all season. They were like it was like a, a college team, and we talked about this on previous shows. You know, here's a, you know, here's a bunch of guys, you know, sitting in the stands, you know, because they have to socially distance, sitting way at the end of the dugout and just ragging the other pitcher, like like we used right. to in college. You know. Yeah. And, and they started, like, five fights or something. In a 60-game season, they had, like, five brawls, you know. So uh, you got to love that. You know, about once a, once a week and a half, they're brawling. You know, I mean, you got to yeah. love that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, again, I, I, I have to say, though, Manning Lee, with all that he was dealt, um, to take a team that deep in the playoffs, you know, that, that's a, a, that, that, has, that says something about him, at least says something um, – about you know what he did as a manager, as a person, and um, and and really, you got to give a little credit to Jeter and and his staff. They did something right. I mean, amazingly, we ragged yes. the hell out of him earlier uh, when he came on board and all the changes he made. But look, look where they ended up. You know, yeah. they're a they're a they're a they're a raise in the making. They're an A's in the making. You watch. I think they got the right um, formula, and they really we'll see how are. that works out. They really are next season. Uh, Again, we don't know how long things are going to last the way they are, but I'm betting we have at least a 150 game season next year. Watch how Mattingly's team performs having gone through this year together. They'll add a few pieces. Some of their veterans will be back. I I look for the Marlins to be a a player in the end at least for a few years to come. Well, um, yeah, yeah, and Marte was hurt at the end of that run. He broke yeah. his hand on a foul tip or something. Um, who who they had gotten obviously you know well from the from the D backs uh, right. there, Eric. And I'll just say one one quick thing. So uh, great job, David Ross, this year taking over for Joe Madden. But um, you know, um, I I don't think I don't think he won the award, but I think he's a worthy finalist. Tingler was not the best manager in his own division. So I mean, you can say what you want. Uh, he wasn't uh, the Dodgers even prove that at the, the last couple series of the year where the Padres could have really out, you know, done some damage and, and really made a, a difference in the standings, maybe even gotten to that number one, uh, which the Dodgers had ran away and, and the Padres, because they exceeded expectations is why Tingler is in here. Um, I don't think that that still over supersedes <laughs> what, you know, Dave Roberts did not to mention that most of their starting staff were rookies or second year guys on the Dodgers, except for Kershaw, you know, um, and Bueller, I mean, is a stud, obviously he's now the ace of the staff. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, but Kershaw's still getting it done, but I mean, you look at, you know, Gonsolin and, and uh, they did have stripling part of the year, but um, you know, you look at that, you look at May. Um, I, I mean, even some of the guys, Urias, like a lot of guys that had even coming out of the bullpen were not guys with experience that comes down to right. managing that comes down to managing. That's what that comes down to, using them in the right situation. And we saw that Dave Roberts did that and was not too big and not too scared at the end, even in the World Series, to bench a, a proven closer like Kenley Jansen when he realized it was not the best move for his team to bring in Kenley Jansen. Um, right. You know, who was not, who was, you know, allowing walks, allowing base runners, whether or not, I mean, obviously the error in center field wasn't his fault, but it's not like he also was where he was supposed to be on that play afterwards. So let's not kid ourselves, right? 
And right. I think that that's exactly what should have happened to Kenley Jansen. And I hope he learned from that. And Or maybe he's just done. Maybe he just is like, hey, there's my World Series and I'll get another big contract from some little team over here or something that'll pay me a bunch of money to come in there. I think that I'm going to save a bunch of games and I'm really just going to walk some dudes or whatever. But um, I will say this about Don Mattingly. They were thinking about firing him this past offseason because they lost 105 games. Right. And he comes back. They used 61 players in 60 games. Think about that for a second. 61 players in 60 games. They used more players than there were games and made the playoffs. Wow. And made the noise. <laughs> I didn't so, realize that. Wow. To me, Don Mattingly is the deserving uh, manager of the year for the NL. Yeah. So I think we're all in agreement there. Before we move on, did you guys happen to catch uh, Dave Roberts' uh, speech on the podium after the presentation of the trophy? Uh, by any chance, you know, they all had a few things to say, but I only bring it up because it shows again, the character of a guy like Dave Roberts and why he's so well liked and why he was as a player too. He was thanking people. He thanked Rick Honeycutt, the pitching coach who was there for the development of Kenley J uh, Clayton Kershaw and Kenley Jansen and a few others. Thanked Rick Honeycutt. He thanked Ross Stripling as part of his speech for helping this team. I've never seen a manager do anything like that before. And I, I just, my hat's off to him for that kind of uh, character and integrity and the kind of thing. He recognized people who everyone had forgotten. When's the last time you thought about Rook Honeycutt? And who would have thought that Ross Stripling would even be mentioned? He got traded, you know, but if you might remember the first two weeks of the season, he reeled off three wins for the Dodgers. Uh, so they traded him, but Roberts thanked him for being a part of it. That is a classy manager and a classy man. And that's one of the reasons I was infuriated that he wasn't one of the three finalists. I'd still give it to Mattingly, but I think Roberts should have been one of the finalists. Anyway, go ahead. Um. I just want to give a shout out. I mean, I think you're right. I think after everything Roberts has been through, not even to get nominated as a finalist this year was kind of ridiculous, especially when the guy from your own division that you beat out is in there. But I mean, yeah. I get it. You know, it, it is what it is. And this short season, there's a lot of weird things like that. One of the weird things is this guy behind me uh, was not mentioned as a finalist for MVP. Um, and, you know, there were some guys that had some good, good stuff going on. Tried at 17 homers, batted 281, nine doubles. Stolen base, 46 RBIs in uh, 53 games. So, you know, he was tied for third in AL and wins above replacement with Abreu, who's a, who's a, a finalist, right? Um, and still had a 2.6 war in 53 games, uh, which is, you know. But for the first time ever on his team, he had a teammate with more war than him, which was Anthony Rendon with 2.7, which I think is a good sign moving forward for the Angels um, that Trout did not have the best – overall war production and still was able to make an impact on the team and something that we brought out before um, with of course the dad power that you know we bring up and Jim obviously you mentioned this is he had that streak after baby bat was born that uh, was just any pitcher that was pitching anywhere near the zone was just getting annihilated and I mean like right. I mean like not like a fun double or a cute single or a little blooper I mean like he was smashing pitches that whole like two or three week period like it looked like nobody was ever going to get him out um and um you know I I'm I'm interested and in, I hope with the CBA that you're right Eric that we get back to a normal season they're about yes. to go through more negotiations which is never good for Major League Baseball because they can never these two sides just, you know, it's not like the NBA where these players, you know, <clears throat> they're, they're all, each side goes, okay, 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 eventually. Right. Um, the MLB never goes, okay, okay, okay. They go, okay, okay, do it my way? Okay, yeah, but it's my way, right? Okay, all right, all right. That's it. And it's just, you know, I hope that they get back to normal full season again because over 162 games, nobody can do what this guy can do. And um, I think that consistency would have shown out again this year had they played that much even despite being on a losing team again, they made a little run at the end there, but I mean, you know, it just was never really, you never felt like they were going to get there. They just didn't have yeah. the horses in the barn 
where it came, comes to pitching. And I hope that whatever the situation is, I don't care if it's Mickey Callaway. I don't care if it's whatever it is, whatever the situation is, Artie, whether it's finding the right GM, the assistant GMs, uh, having better relationships with other teams, getting out of the way of decisions, getting out of the way of your own pride if a trade takes a day longer than you wanted it to, uh, whatever it comes down to, get it done. Get it done this offseason. Get some pitching, and let's, let's get this guy where people can see him and people understand uh, because, honestly, like even this year with what he – like you could still make an argument that he's MVP – and he had his worst year. You know, I mean, it's just yeah, one of the greatest yeah. of all time. I mean, it it's was, just uh, yeah, it just uh, one of the things that I I look at and I see. You know, it's almost like a lot of people just take him for granted. I'm not talking about serious baseball fans and people like us who are analysts and commentators, but uh, some people go to games and take him for granted when he hits one out or makes a great, you know, over-the-shoulder catch bumping into the wall. Oh, that's Trout. That's what he does. Yeah, that is Trout, and it is what he does, but he's the only one that can do it that way and will always be the only one that can do it that way. So, yeah, kudos to Trout for – I thought I thought he had a great season, but didn't it? We, we've talked about it ad nauseum, and we will more about the Angels – hopefully in positive ways. Uh, we have one last award to talk about, and that's the Rookie of the Year Award. So let me start with the American League. The, the nominees are Kyle Lewis from Seattle, Luis Robert from Chicago White Sox, and Christian, I think Javier is how his name is pronounced, from Houston. Uh, to me, it's a very clear winner. And before I tell you who I think the winner should be, Early in the year, uh, MLB does their promotions where they try to get, uh, you know, focus on certain players. You might remember last year they had the Christian Yelich and Cody Bellinger, the Yelly versus Belly things. And they were touting Luis Robert. And I saw many commercials where they said, is he the next Mike Trout? And I thought to myself, but why put that kind of pressure on that guy? He hasn't even played in the majors for a season yet. And while he had a decent year, he's going to have a great career. He ended up hitting 280. Okay. He had a great year. Uh, as for Javier with the Astros, he's probably one of the reasons that they were able to make the playoffs. I don't know how they beat the A's, uh, tell you the truth. They just, but that's what can happen in a two out of three series. And that's why I feared the Giants and Mike Yastrzemski playing the Dodgers. Notice how I was able to get Yaz mentioned in there, Jim. Of course. Of uh, course. But my pick in the American League would be Kyle Lewis and Mariners for the numbers he put up. Uh, you know, they, they didn't make the playoffs. They tried a little run right at the end. But that guy had a solid, solid year with not a lot of support around him. He hits, he hits for power, he steals bases, he's got a good arm, he's, I think, got a great future. He's my pick for American League Rookie of the Year. What about you guys? I didn't get to see him enough, uh, although I watched, you know, some of the uh, Angel Mariners games, which, you know, Mike Trout always lights up, the, you know, and you kind of forget about everybody everybody else when Mike Trout's play, performing against the, uh, the – excuse me, against the Mariners, but um, – that but the the guy uh, uh, Luis uh, Robert right that's first name Luis right right um, he he has he really impressed me and I got to see him in spring training um, I actually didn't I, not that I went there but I was watching some spring training games specifically to watch Andrew Vaughn who was the first baseman at Cal a couple years ago yeah first picked by the White Sox and uh, that was a game by the way I watched and Brian Terang my buddy Brian Terang's kid Bryce got in that bat and hit a rocket um, to left but anyway. Um, when I saw him play, I'm like, okay, this guy already looks like a major league all-star and he hasn't even really played the big leagues much, you know, right. just already has all of the, the, the tools. And he had the, bar the bravado. You could tell he wasn't going to be afraid of these pitchers. He was a real uh, competitor. And uh, I got to believe that once Andrew Vaughn cracks that lineup and then they got a young guy like Robert out in the outfield and like all those other young guys that they have, 
hey, Tony La Russa might be able to actually be the in another conversation next year or the year after, manager of the year. Who knows? <laughs> if, that happens, things have happened. Will, if that happens, I'll buy both of you guys dinner at Outback Steakhouse. Hey, he was the right guy. Even if I have to fly Benny out to L.A. He was the right guy in the right place with those uh, those other two organizations when he took over for at the A's and when he took over for the uh, uh, Cardinals, he had the horses. And all he had to do was manage the horses. Well, I'm telling you yeah. what, when Andrew Vaughn gets up there and gets his feet settled in, as a major league hitter, that's another huge horse that they're going to have uh, with this Robert kid. So, uh, I, I, hey, you got to watch out for the uh, White Sox. I think they're going to be uh, a pretty good team coming up here. And, and I think Robert is my pick for sure. Okay. Jim, you're going to okay. have to keep the stakes under 20 bucks for this, apparently. That's what I was <laughs> That's the under 20 thing. You got to get the eight ounce, not the 12. All right. Um, right. Listen, I, I think all three of these guys are very deserving. Javier, you know, Houston, you know, you, like you, you need more pitching, you know, like there we are with the Angels. We can't find a guy for our life to get us through six innings. And, you know, Houston's just pulling him out of thin air. You got Oakland pulling him out of thin air. Oh, we got another guy like that. He's over there. The Dodgers down the street, pulling him out of thin air. Anytime we want. Oh, there's another guy that can go eight for us. Don't worry. He's got the nastiest stuff you've ever seen since the guy that we pulled up last week. Um, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable to me how teams can figure out how to do these things. Almost all teams. Um, you know, but uh, Kyle Lewis, the difference between Lewis and some of these other guys is Lewis plays great defense um, yeah. as well. And he can hit. So I think that's what separates him and Robert in this conversation, even though Robert with the expectations of signing a six year, $50 million deal before he ever stepped foot on the field. I mean, that was, you know, that was a risky move by the white Sox, but I mean, ultimately one that will probably end up paying off. Um, you give the guy some money now, make him happy. And then uh, you pull in a guy like Tony La Russa. I mean, anything could happen. You never know. Um, but um, I, I, I would probably take, um, I would probably take Lewis just because of the combination of his defense. Um, yeah, Jim, if you haven't seen that guy play, he's, he's pretty good. Uh, yeah, Mariner's I got I got to look him up a little bit. Yeah, I got to check good. him out. Yeah, yeah. and you know, Jim, hey guys, Lewis. guys, real quick, real quick. By the way, we're getting a little tight um, uh, on our Zoom time. Remember, we kind of have a time limit with Zoom. Yeah. So uh, we're going to probably need to wrap up in the next ten minutes or so. Okay, then I want to really quickly go to. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Patrick Becker, Goodyear, Arizona, our listener, brought up a question that I think is uh, in-depth enough that we need to push it next week. And it's talking about the DH in National League. And he has a lot of stats here and a lot of comments, and I've got some other things. Pat, I'll get to that next week. Uh, bear with me, guys. Uh, let's see. I mentioned a deal earlier that I had sources tell me about. And here's the deal. Jock Peterson, as we know, is a free agent and uh, probably not going to be back with the Dodgers. So consider this. Jock Peterson, Tony Gonsolin, and three prospects going to Cleveland. One of those prospects, by the way, an outfielder named DJ Peters, who's a stud, if you haven't seen him yet. He's major league ready right now. Going to Cleveland for Francisco Lindor. Uh, Dodgers then move Seager to third base, which you predicted, Jim, and turn to DH. And uh, somehow the Dodgers have found a way to improve. I'm not saying it's guaranteed to happen, but the sources have told me that what's happening right now is that they're trying to agree on how much to pay Peterson. And that it's pretty much – that's it. The concern I have is Lindor is a free agent after this year, and I don't see the Dodgers signing him to a long-term deal like Betts. Uh, you know, I, I just don't see it happening. One other thing I want to mention real quick, uh, if you watched the games on TV, MLB did these promos where they would show great moments from the past World Series, uh, Joe Carter's walk-off home run. They also chose to show the night that the ball went through Bill Buckner's legs for that uh, World Series Game 6 loss. People, there was a Game 7 of that World Series that the Red Sox led 3 to nothing in the seventh inning and blew. And yet Bill Buckner has always shouldered the blame for that World Series. I was very disappointed that they chose to use that as one of the highlights. Uh, 
Uh, just real quickly, Bill Buckner, here's the stats that I'm going to be posting on social media. He played 2,517 games in his career. He was a batting champion. He put up great numbers. But 2,517 games in his career, he never struck out twice in a single game. Okay? So uh, let's give some props to Bill Buckner. That guy, may he rest in peace. He just recently passed a couple months ago. Uh, let's see. I've got a trivia question. Very difficult trivia question. This is from Rochelle in Los Angeles, our regular listener. Uh, aside from her questions about Benny that she was asking, I'll leave those alone. Uh, okay, here's a question. Remember the All-Century baseball team in 1999 that they put together and they had the big ceremony at the All-Star game? Okay, three shortstops were named to the baseball all-century team in 1999. Hannes Wagner, Ernie Banks, and who was number three? Hannes Wagner, Ernie Banks, and who was number three? Ripken. No, surprisingly. That was my guess when I first got the question. Um, this was a 99, you said? Yeah, but it was the all-century team, so it goes back to 1900. So, you know, a lot of great shortstops played during those era. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm going to um, give you guys a count of four, three. Ernie two. Banks? Uh, Ernie he Banks was, was, he was on there. Named. Yeah. You're going to love the answer. You're so much going to love the answer. No, I, there's no way Rick Roden was a shortstop. There is no <laughs> way. No, but it sure was Ty Cobb. That was no answer. way. Yes, he was a number three. <laughs> Pretty good all century, Jim. He's an all century player. He played in 1911. He started like his his best years like were 11, 12. Okay, so I mean, don't you think <laughs> I, you guys have heard my my uh, my gripe about all of these uh, these sort of all century these you know the, the oh, eras yeah. playing against he the eras. He beat out I Cal mean, Ripken Jr. He beat out Cal Ripken Jr. Jim, think about that. He beat out he I, I beat out Ozzie Smith. He beat out Ozzy Smith. He beat out you know A Rod. A Rod played for Reese. the Mariners and A -Rod, right. in the '90s. <laughs> I mean, come on, uh, you know, of course. Oh, yeah, Pee Wee Cal. Reese. Oh, Marvin's Pee Wee Reese. Your teammate. I just. I'll uh, tell you what. His seven flat sixty question, speed it... was was world class in twenty or nineteen eleven. You know he could, <laughs> at, at, you know what I mean. Nobody ran a seven flat sixty in nineteen eleven, but he, he didn't probably have, did. He played shortstop without <laughs> web between his fingers. Think about that. I know, I know. <laughs> That's tough. I just uh, I want to thank you, Rochelle, in Los Angeles, because I was going through all the different mail this afternoon. And there were a few trivia questions, and when I saw that one, she actually put a personal note to me saying, "You got to lay this one on." Uh, so I went with that. Uh, this is so how I you hit in, in 2011, or 1911, right? <laughs> you chop yeah, and you run. It. Chop and run. <laughs> uh, having said that, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. And I want to thank everybody who, who listens on Spotify and a lot of people watching now on YouTube. And, uh, you know, you guys are the reasons we do this. You know, Jim and Benny and I are, are friends, but you're the reasons we do this, and we thank you so much. Uh, get a hold of me. Uh, go to Twitter, at Dr. Baseball, at Eric Lennenberg. Facebook, you can hit me up, Eric Lennenberg. I've been a little more active there lately. Uh, and also on Spotify, shortly to be released after the first of the year, will be a collection of some audio, audio book work. Uh, that I released, that I recorded in the last couple months is going to be released by the publisher. I'll let you guys know where it is awesome. and how to get a hold of it. Jim, how about you? How do they get you? Uh, born into baseball dot com for the uh, the my book that I wrote, hit number one a few years ago. Uh, you can see all about that there. Um, and then uh, uh, Facebook, Jim Campanis Jr., which goes feeds my Twitter, uh, Jim Campanis Jr. And um, every now and then I, I check Instagram, but I don't have a whole lot of action going on there. Uh, you can also listen to some of my stories that I told from the book on Spotify just by searching Jim Campanis Jr. And my kid, my kids still think I'm cool because I'm searchable on Spotify. So um, <laughs> those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Benny, what's your uh, what, what's your story? 
Where are you at? If they think Spotify is cool, they should read your book, Jim. Um, <laughs> anyway, best-selling you author, think. guys. Dad, you think. You, you think. <laughs> and he was a pro baseball player. All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, guys, Benny Bam. Uh, it's Benny Bam Legacy on uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram and stuff. And, of course, you can always find me at Angels Baseball Addicts on any of your social media avenues that you go to. And it's the Backstop Show on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and, of course, now YouTube. And, of course, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, all those different places, Anchor, FM, uh, where you can find the show. By the way, Pete Rose was on that all-century team 10 years after he was banned from baseball when that list came out, he was still on the all century team, which is actually, um, which is actually a, a approved by major league baseball, that all century team. So they approved Pete Rose to be on that team, even knowing that he was banned from baseball already. And the MC of course, of that ceremony was Ben Scully. Oh, oh wow. I didn't remember that. That's great. You pointed that out. I he's the voice of the, Rose he's a voice the of the century. Oh, he's the voice be, of the century, be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and then Eric, I, Eric, did you have something else you wanted to add uh, after our sign-offs? I did. I did. Uh, we're coming up on holiday season soon. And I just wanted to mention, I already thanked our listeners and I'll thank them again for listening and sending us just incredible feedback. We get some of the best, most knowledgeable questions and comments from our listeners. <clears throat> but I wanted to mention uh, that just to you two gentlemen, uh, Jim, uh, we go back a few years. We've been through a lot together. We've had so many great experiences. And, uh, you know, you've become a brother to me more than just a friend. And, you know, I look forward to your next road trip out here. Maybe we'll go up to Sedona to do our laundry like we did that other time. But I, 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 have a, say, I, have, I appreciate that, Eric. And by the way, I have, a, unfortunately, with my eye, this surgery, I can't go above 3,000 feet. We can't oh. go, <laughs> but we can't go for about six months. But then, uh, perfect time in the summer to get out of the heat. We'll head on yeah. up to uh, to uh, Prescott or or uh, Sedona. That's a funny story, Benny. We'll tell you uh, offline one of these days. Uh, <laughs> what 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 did, what did two bored guys do on a Saturday, right in Arizona? Yeah, drive to Sedona <laughs> and do your laundry. Uh, the the other thing I wanted to say is, Benny, I uh, I look forward to doing this also with you every week. I uh, Jim and I have talked a lot about this. Uh, not only are you a great guy and a young man with a lot of character and a lot of honesty and integrity, and you're willing to stand up for what you believe in. And we tackled some of those things on this show because of you. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of you for doing that and putting us in that arena. And I just want you to know that uh, sometimes you'll mention on the air that when you were a kid, you saw me on TV doing interviews and things like that. Well, someday down the road, I'm going to be telling people, you know what? I worked with Benny Bam. I actually got to work with that guy when he was on his way up. I think your potential is unlimited, and I'm there for you every step of the way. I love doing this show with both you guys, and I just wanted to thank you both for being there with me. And that's, awesome. that's what I had to say. Absolutely. Doing the show with you guys is amazing. I, I really appreciate that, uh, the kind words, the references, all that kind of stuff that you guys – uh, help me out with because it does mean a lot, uh, especially when you, you know, my experience, I have experience, but it's in a different field. It's, it's not necessarily transferable. So as you're going through life and trying to do all these things, it definitely helps a lot um, to, to have that there and, and outside of the experience. And, um, you know, Eric, it's, it, it is a fact that I used to watch you on TV. Uh, and, um, you know, I actually didn't really like Barry Bonds until I saw the interview you did with him. Uh, and then I kind of liked him a little bit. Uh, outside of, of course, that I wanted my angels to beat it. But other than that, um, and we did. But, um, you know, uh, and, and Jim, uh, you know, it, it's been uh, it's been a pleasure doing multiple shows with you now. And, um, you know, it's it's nice to have uh, someone that, you know, supports you and stuff. And uh, there's been other people that have definitely done that in my life in different ways. And I appreciated it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's it's unflailing with you. Uh, you're, you're just always um, so consistent about what you say and what you do. And obviously the knowledge of the game just through having lived through it and experienced it is just uh, something I really take in 
with, uh, you know, like you talk about when you were a kid and you would just sit there and absorb. When you talk about baseball, that's what I'm doing. I'm just like a little kid sitting here and absorbing it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's true for um, yourself. It's true for a lot of the great people we've had on. Um, it's true for Eric. It's true for guys like Jim Wagner at Throw Zone. By the way, if you haven't noticed, he's got all these guys in Cy Young and World Series consideration that he uh, had. And we'll have Jim Wagner back on soon, too. But, um, you know, that's true. And there's a lot of things. And I always say, you know, um, be thankful and, and uh, always be humble. And, and I think it's important to do that. And uh, we've got we've I think we've all been very lucky in our lives, especially when it comes to something we love, like baseball that we've had a lot of great experiences with a lot of great people that have taught us yes. a lot. And I think uh, like I'm still learning from guys like you and, and a lot of others and, uh, and your experiences with those people trickle down. Like when you tell the stories about, about Al and about Finn Scully, by the way, happy birthday, Al, as Eric posted on our backstop page as well. And I shared it there. Um, you know, all of these things are still continuing. It's not that that legacy is not gone. It's still continuing on through, reliving these stories and legacies through your dad and through your grandpa and all the different stories that happened. And I think that that's very important, um, you know, to continue those things and pass them along. And in telling me that stuff, I'll pass it along eventually um, to someone too. And, and hopefully that just continues and continues and continues that, that uh, those legacies and those things and those stories. So fantastic stuff. We're fortunate guys. We have a show with people that actually care. We don't have somebody, you know, producing in our ear or people that are insincere one way off the air and then get a certain way on the air. Um, I think that that's fantastic. Um, and it's all sincere, genuine, you know, just, we want to love baseball and we want to present it in a way that is genuine. And I think we all share that. No, nope, most, most definitely. definitely. And, I, and thank you guys too. I, I kind of, you guys it got me a little off guard there, Eric, but this, and, and Benny, this is a, uh, quite a treat every week when we get to do this and I'm sorry I got it I'm on a kind of the DL a little bit here with the uh with the, with the goggles but but uh I appreciate you guys like you know dealing with the, the little time off I had to take you know in order to uh you know kind of be able to see with at least my one eye here but um this has been a blast and and and, and, I, and I, I look forward to continuing uh working with you guys on this it's just a lot of fun and I look forward to it and I really enjoy the new sort of like zoom thing that we're doing unfortunately no <laughs> We might have gone over a little bit this week, so uh, if, if this part gets cut off, it, it's uh, it's your fault, Eric, for talking so long. <laughs> <laughs> right? Usually is, usually, and is. he can still hit with one eye. He can still hit with one eye and catch with one eye. That's what's amazing about it, you know. I did go. I did hit two fifty with a detached retina. By the way, I, I, that was that's a real fact. With the detached retina, I still got a couple of hits and I drove in four runs. But I'll do better with the re, with an attached retina on the next one. <laughs> well, just ask just ask your dad. He'll he'll show you what's up. So. That's right. That's right. Until uh, that's the backstop, guys. That's the backstop. Uh, until next time, that's uh, the Velvet Voice, Eric Lunenberg, the catcher who wasn't a spy, Jim Capanis Jr., and of course, uh, Benny Bam. We're always coming at you strong, and we're going to be coming at you strong next time. The backstop. All right. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>